Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for attending this webinar, which is co-hosted by the prenatal and pediatric special interest groups. My name is Rena Vanzo and I'm a genetic counselor at Lineagen, which is a company in Salt Lake City. I will provide a brief overview and will be followed by other members of the 4P- scientific advisory group, including Dr. Sarah South, who's a cytogeneticist at ARUP Laboratories, and Dr. Amy Calhoun, who's a medical geneticist at the University of Minnesota. We will then hear from three mothers of children with a 4P deletion, including Veronica, Amanda, and Michelle. Our objectives will be to identify both the medical challenges and achievements in individuals with the deletion of 4P, to learn more about testing strategies in this cohort, namely chromosomal microarray analysis, to understand why genetic counseling, and not just at one time point, but continued genetic counseling, is critical for members of this community, and finally, to gain perspective from families. I'd like to first give you some background about why we wanted to present this webinar. Megan Martin, Mallory Stano, and I approached the 4P- support group earlier this year. We wondered if they would be interested in having genetic counselors on site at their national conference to do things like review prior test results, answer questions, and discuss the benefits of undergoing CMA. To our excitement, the group said yes, they invited us for the conference, and in just 15 minutes of meeting these families, we had learned more about the condition than we had in weeks of pouring through the medical literature. One recurring theme among families was their desire to educate the medical community. This is because many of them had been misinformed from medical providers who may have been indifferent and even disingenuous. Many families were told they would never meet another child with this condition, and I think it's clear to see from this photo that they were so very wrong. The 4P- support group currently has over 600 members. There are also groups in Australia, the UK, Spain, and Italy. In the US, the national conference is held every other year, and there are more frequent regional gatherings. As you can see, girls are more commonly affected than boys for reasons that are not understood. Also, the oldest living member of the group is 63 years old and quite healthy. You'll see a picture of her later on in the webinar. Her name is Carol, and she was seen in clinic by Dr. John Carey, who's another member of the 4P Scientific Advisory Board, when he was a fellow back in 1976. Carol still comes to Dr. Carey's genetics clinic, which is really critical given some of the adult onset features of 4P that you'll learn about when Dr. Calhoun presents. So ultimately, this webinar is being held for all of the families we met in an effort to meet one of their goals, to educate others and raise awareness for the world of 4P-. When you look this condition up in the typical resources, you'll see black and white and often impersonal pictures. You also, of course, read the laundry list of medical characteristics. And other than this piece about the Greek helmet, this list is really nonspecific and could describe a variety of conditions. What you won't read about are all of these personality traits and colorful habits. These individuals absolutely love to dance and listen to music. This picture on the bottom right was taken at a dance reception at this summer's conference. This young lady is 16 years old. These individuals also love to be the center of attention. If you are engaged with one, with one of them and suddenly turn your attention to someone else, they do whatever it takes to gain that attention back. And that may be pulling your hair, giving you a friendly slap on the leg, or even spilling a glass of, of water in front of them. They're very aware of their surroundings. They can tell if the mood and tone of a conversation is positive or negative, and they respond accordingly. They also have an annual Halloween costume contest where the public can go online and vote. They idolize their siblings. Many of them have enviable locks of curly hair. They tend to sit with their legs crossed like the young man in the upper right. And as you can clearly see, they have infectious smiles. While many of these individuals share commonalities, their deletions vary tremendously and they are medically unique. 
After the conference, Lineage and analyzed 33 samples uh, by CMA. This slide is meant to give you a glimpse into that variability. One deletion, Alexa's, is over 32 megabases, while another, Skylar's, is comparatively quite small and interstitial. Of note, 10 of these particular individuals have a co-occurring duplication that is not shown here. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. South for more about the cytogenomic details. Thank you. I just wanted to give an overview of the genetics and the different technologies that are used to detect alterations associated with Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome. Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome is due to deletions of a region within 4P16.3. As seen in the previous slide, the size of the deletion varies and most are greater than 4 megabases, approximately 50 to 60 percent. However, not all of them, in fact many of them, may be missed by a standard karyotype. Karyotype resolution varies, but is usually on the order of greater than 5 to 10 megabases. However, what I'm showing in this picture in the bottom is an image of a cytogenetically evident deletion where you can see the chromosome on your left has a white fluffy top, whereas the chromosome on your right is missing that fluffy top. And you can see the cartoon image of it. This would be an example of a terminal cytogenetically visible deletion. Please note, though, that, some, that these can be missed on a peripheral blood karyotype and are even more likely to be missed on a karyotype analysis of amniocytes or chorionic villi as they have generally lower resolution. Another top technology that may be useful is fluorescence in situ hybridization. This can detect alterations that are occurring within the region complementary to the fish probe. So we have a critical region, which we'll discuss a little bit later, but we're not entirely sure that we understand the critical region. Just the same, we can create a fish probe to this region to see if it is present or absent. The image on the lower right shows the standard fish analysis. The red probe marks the critical region for Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome. The green probe marks the centromere of chromosome 4. So you can see one chromosome hybridizing both the red and the green, indicating an intact region for the critical region, whereas the other chromosome, there is no red signal, indicating a deletion of this region. Deletions between 2 and 4 megabases occur in approximately 25 to 30 percent of patients. They can be picked up with this fish probe, but only if the clinician suspects this syndrome. This slide represents the genes in the currently considered critical region. The estimation of this region varies. We've highlighted some of the genes in this region and some of their proposed roles but it's important to recognize that there is still a lot to learn about the exact relationship between these genes and the features of Wolf-Hirschhorn. And it is also possible that some patients who fit the clinical description may have deletions that are slightly out of this region and may be missed by a fish probe to this region. Wolf-Hirschhorn can also be caused by deletions of 4P16.3 that occur in tandem or in conjunction with a duplication of another chromosome end. These are often due to unbalanced translocation, which may be de novo or may be due to a parental balance translocation. What I'm showing on the bottom, on the left-hand side, is a possible parental balance translocation where you can see an exchange between the red and blue chromosomes. Let's think of the blue chromosome as chromosome 4. And then you can see that a segregation of this balanced translocation can lead to an unbalanced version where we're missing part of chromosome 4 and have a duplication of another chromosome end. These rearrangements may be too small to see by a standard chromosome study and may require molecular technologies to detect. A fish probe to the critical region on 4P may detect the deletion but not reveal that it is occurring in conjunction with a duplication of another chromosome end. And so therefore, alternative technologies, such as CMA, which we will discuss, can be more informative. 
It's also interesting that there is an olfactory repeat cluster on the tip of chromosome 4 and olfactory repeat clusters on other chromosome ends that can um, mediate recurrent rearrangements. There is an olfactory cluster on 8P and another on 11P that mediates recurrent rearrangements between 4P and 8P, as well as 4P and 11P. So a number of families with wolf hirschhorn syndrome have some of the same recurring uh, balanced translocations leading to unbalanced translocations. Chromosomal microarray is a nice alternative technology in that it has a whole genome analysis, such as chromosomes, that has the resolution comparative or even better than fish. So when you have normal appearing chromosome 4, a microarray analysis can still show that there is a small deletion of the tip of chromosome 4, as shown here in this middle panel. This particular deletion would be too small to see by cytogenetic analysis, and yet because of the nature of this test, when performed, there does not have to be an a priori consideration of wolf hirschhorn syndrome. And subsequently, you can see the 4P deletion, and then you can go back and ask, does the patient have some of the characteristics consistent with wolf hirschhorn syndrome, and then can also provide anticipatory guidance for other features. The genomic microarray technology also allows a more precise characterization of the genetic abnormality because the probes on the microarray are mapped back to the human genome. You can go into human genome browsers, such as the University of California Santa Cruz browser, and see the specific genes involved. And this specific mapping of deletions has helped us understand the more precise role of different genes within this region. For example, literature has focused on a gene, LETM1, as perhaps responsible for the seizure phenotype. However, I'm showing a patient here that has a terminal 4P deletion as represented by this red bar. And you can see the probes below are hybridizing with less intensity, indicating the deletion. This patient has a very severe phenotype. She will, her mother will discuss her phenotype later. We can see that her deletion does not include LETM1, and so this allows us to consider other genes within this patient's deletion that may be contributory to the seizure phenotype. As Rena mentioned, there is variability of 4P deletion. Therefore, the analysis of patients by this technology can be very useful because it doesn't make assumptions about exactly where the deletion must be. We can see, again, that there are deletions that are smaller than 4 megabase that may be missed by a standard karyotype, and there are also patients with atypical deletions that may be missed by a standard fish analysis. I also want to mention that microarrays are not all created equal. So microarrays will have coverage according to the regions of the genome represented on the chip. In 2008, we did a study using a back-based array CGH approach, which today is considered lower resolution. There is a patient in that study that was where a 4P deletion was detected, and that was all that was detected. In 2012, this patient's microarray was repeated, we again detected the 4P deletion, but now had coverage of a region on the tip of 8Q that wasn't previously covered. And we identified a, du a duplication on the tip of 8Q in the reanalysis of this patient. This increases the concern for an unbalanced translocation, although additional testing can be performed on the parents to determine if there is a balanced translocation between these two regions. I will now turn the time over to Dr. Amy Calhoun, a clinical geneticist at the University of Minnesota. Hi, this is Dr. Amy Calhoun. Um, I'm co-chair, one of the co-chairs of the 4P minus scientific advisory board, and I'm a clinical geneticist at the University of Minnesota. And I'm going to discuss some of the clinical findings of 4P-, including um, the diagnostic features.
prenatal diagnosis of 4P minus uh, wolf Hirschhorn syndrome is quite challenging. Well, Hirschhorn syndrome is rarely suspected prenatally, although we do have several members of a support group who were in fact diagnosed prenatally. Many of our mothers report having their due date repeatedly moved back due to poor growth of the baby. And many of our mothers also report early delivery due to suspected placental insufficiency. Um, ultrasound findings that you may see that might be suggestive of wolf Hirschhorn syndrome include intrauterine growth retardation. This is universally found in all of our patients, and in most patients, this is the only prenatal finding. This is typically symmetric, IUGR, and may be quite marked. Some of our patients have cardiac septal defects detected prenatally. Um, also, cleft lip and pellet may be detected. Club foot is sometimes seen, and um, several patients have been picked up due to congenital diaphragmatic hernia. <clears throat> At least one patient has been identified uh, suspected prenatally based on facial gestalt, but this is extremely challenging as you can imagine. Um, Mira, uh, as pictured up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, it does have the facial features of wolf horseman syndrome, including wide-set eyes and the typical region of the upper part of the nose or the glabellar region. However, I personally think that would be very difficult to spot if you didn't know the diagnosis already. <clears throat> Prenatal diagnostic testing can also be quite challenging in the context of wolf horseman syndrome. Um, as most of you know who do a lot of prenatal diagnosis, karyotype is the test we most commonly offer via either AMIO or CBS. As previously noted by Dr. South, this has low sensitivity in the context of wolf Hirschhorn because as many or perhaps more of pathogenic deletions will be missed on standard chromosome analysis and prenatal karyotypes um, are probably even less sensitive due to the lower resolution of prenatal studies. <clears throat> Fish testing is an excellent test, however, as discussed by Dr. South, the performing physician must have an index of suspicion for wolf horsehorn, which is unlikely as most babies' um, only finding is um, intrauterine growth retardation. <clears throat> and therefore, the prenatal findings tend to be quite nonspecific, and um, index of suspicion for wolf horsehorn is usually low prenatally. Cytogenetic, cytogenomic microarray uh, testing is the most sensitive test for this disorder, as discussed by Dr. South. And we are seeing increasing prenatal utilization of this technology. However, this is a huge counseling challenge, as many of you have probably already experienced. A main issue for prenatal counseling in this context of wolf Hirschhorn syndrome is the phenotype of wolf Hirschhorn is extremely broad. And our understanding of genotype-phenotype correlation is really in its infancy. Therefore, it's very difficult to let a parent know what to expect based on prenatal testing if, in fact, we do manage to achieve a prenatal diagnosis. Now I'm going to discuss just for a little bit what the key diagnostic features are for wolf Hirschhorn. I have the facial gestalt listed first because this is really the most specific feature for this particular disorder. Other main features are growth problems, developmental problems, and neurological problems. But as all of you know, growth problems, developmental problems, and neurological problems are common to many microdeletion syndromes and not specific for any particular syndrome. Therefore, the facial gestalt tends to be the hinge of the diagnosis. <clears throat> the wolf horn facial gestalt is historically uh, referred to as the Greek warrior helmet appearance. And I did find a nice picture of a Greek warrior helmet here for you so you can see what the original descriptions were getting at. <clears throat> Key features of the facial appearance include wide set prominent eyes, beautifully curved arched eyebrows, a very prominent nasal bridge and root, and a smaller appearance to the lower part of the mouth, including a small mouth, micrognathia or small jaw, and a short philtrum. Uh, I've included three representative patients here um, to demonstrate that the facial gestalt is uh, variable and how it is impacted by the deletion. 
as you can see here, these patients have very mild versions of the facial features, although they do have prominent wide set eyes and a relative greater size of the upper half of the face as compared with the lower part of the face. Now here's a representative diagram of the telomeric portion of 4P with their deletions color coded. And as you can see, this first patient is pink, the second patient is green, and the third patient is orange. <clears throat> Several of the wolf hirschhorn critical regions have historically been posited to be the main contributor towards the facial features, but as you can see, only two of these three patients include the critical region. Therefore, it's likely that the facial phenotype of wolf hirschhorn is influenced by genes on the most distal telomeric tip in the critical region and also in the proximal or centromeric part of 4P. Growth is a, a significant issue for all children with wolf hirschhorn syndrome. They universally have very slow growth. This typically is prenatal and onset and persists for their entire life and responds only partially to caloric supplementation. Many of our children have G-tubes placed and still have very slow growth. Some families have elected to have growth hormone therapy, and as some of our patients are in fact growth hormone deficient, some have very good responses. Other patients have had not had impressive responses. Due to the um, difficulties with growth, the um, wolf hirschhorn 4 p support group has been putting together uh, condition-specific growth curves. wolf hirschhorn growth curves are available for up to two years of age, but we are endeavoring to increase this to through adulthood for our patients. Development is another key issue for people with wolf hirschhorn. Developmental delays are nearly universal. However, there are patients reported with normal cognition. Overall, delays are much milder and more variable in real life than, is what, than what's in the medical literature and especially in the historical textbooks. Many individuals not only learn to walk, but dance very well and can ride a trike or bike. Some children and adults can read and do math, and one of my own patients has math as his favorite subject. Another key feature of development in patients with 4P- is continued lifelong developmental progress. Several of our patients have learned to walk and speak in adulthood. For example, we have a picture here of Carly, who was 18 when she learned to walk independently. Importantly, developmental regression is not a feature of wolf hirschhorn syndrome. And if your patient has this, it should prompt a detailed workup. Neurological problems can be quite uh, challenging for individuals with 4P-, and the main problem is seizures. The majority of people with wolf hirschhorn syndrome will have seizures at some point. They tend to onset in early infancy or in toddlerhood, and may improve or resolve completely in childhood. But we are starting to notice in some of our adults that seizures may recur. Individuals with 4P- who don't have a seizure disorder, a formal seizure disorder or epilepsy, may still have significant problems with seizures during illness or when febrile. Also, there is a typical EEG finding in patients with 4P-, even patients who do not have a seizure disorder. This can complexify discontinuing anti-seizure therapies as the EEG is often never fully normal. <clears throat> a second neurological problem that is extremely common and will for shorten is generalized hypotonia. This may have something to do with the preferred cross-leg posture that our patients like to assume. Other common health problems include congenital heart defects. Although these are very common, found in about 50% of individuals, they're typically not complex and are usually repairable, and they are not a common cause of death for our patients. Um, I find that the uh, congenital heart def defects are probably overemphasized in the medical literature, um, not to minimize that they can be a problem in some patients. Hearing problems are quite pervasive. Um, recurrent otitis with secondary conductive loss is extremely common and is probably due to the smallness of the lower part of the skull in our patients. Uh, sensorineural hearing loss is also seen, is fairly common um, in about a quarter of patients and can be progressive. Vision problems are also quite common and can range from uh, malformations of the eye such as retinal coloblomas to requirements for glasses, 
to even uh, significant visual impairment. Uh, dental problems are also quite common. Cleft lip and palate is seen in around a third of individuals. Um, patients can also have delayed or early tooth, tooth eruption or abnormal tooth eruption and other problems with their teeth. As we're getting better data on following up our adult patients with 4P-, we are finding um, some new information. Unfortunately, uh, very little information on adults is um, available uh, in the literature, in the medical literature. Fortunately, the 4P- support group systematically collects data on its members, and we are finding out that many individuals live into late adulthood. Here's a picture of Carol, our oldest member. She's 63 and doing very well. And here's a picture of Maggie, who's 41 and exceptionally healthy. Um, other problems that we are noticing during lifelong follow-up of our patients include immune deficiency. This is primarily do due to low immunoglobulins in patients in whom it's been studied, although it's often not studied. And most of our parents do report that their children have recurrent respiratory infections. Typically, the immune deficiency does not lead to severe recurrent infections, although some of our patients do have significant difficulty with recurrent infections. We have emerging data that cancers appear to be more common in patients with Wolf Hirschhorn than the general population. The most common cancers reported in our population are liver cancers and hematologic malignancies. At this point, this is uh, merely emerging data, and I don't have hard statistics for you. Hopefully, we can get those in the future. <clears throat> Another problem that we are beginning to identify during life, lifelong follow-up of our children is renal failure. This appears to happen in late childhood or early young adulthood. Uh, renal transplant has been performed in several of our patients and has been well tolerated. We're also beginning to note premature aging in some of our individuals with um, early graying and other aging type features. <clears throat> now uh, this concludes my portion and I'm going to hand off to our parent panelists who are going to talk about parenting in, in the setting of Wolf Hirshhorn. All right, first we're going to hear from Veronica about her beautiful daughter, Evie Ann. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Veronica and my daughter is Evie Ann. Um, I'd like to first start off by telling you a little bit about my pregnancy. Um, everything in the beginning seemed to be, you know, healthy and fine um, until I was 17 weeks pregnant and I had a subchorionic hemorrhage and I was placed on bed rest. Um, at that point, I had suspected that something was going on, so we had six ultrasounds performed, um, you know, afterwards. and. On the sixth ultrasound, we had discovered that she had a cleft lip and palate and intrauterine growth retardation at 30 weeks. Um, also, at 30 weeks, we had discovered that her kidneys were below the fifth growth percentile and that she had some heart anomalies and facial features similar to the Greek warrior helmet in wolf Hirshhorn syndrome. Um, at that time, we decided to get an amniocentesis done, and at 32 weeks, the results had shown that uh, she did have wolf Hirshhorn syndrome. Um, at that time, we had met with a genetic counselor and a high-risk OB and to discuss the results, and they had let us know that she had a very large deletion size and that she would be considered um, more on the severe side of the syndrome. So we were all really frightened, not really knowing what to expect when she was born. Um, they could not give me a life expectancy. They could not say whether or not she was going to survive birth or not. Just because this is such a rare syndrome, we just didn't know what to expect. And so they had referred me to an organization called Angel Watch. And what Angel Watch had did was they had helped me develop a birthing plan. And Angel Watch, um, you know, went over a bunch of different things that I never would have thought about um, as far as, you know, 
being in the delivery room and who's going to get to hold her, what testing is going to be allowed, um, whether or not you know, she was going to be resuscitated if she came out not breathing. Um, so at 37 weeks, we implemented the birthing plan, and I was induced. Um, Evie Ann delivered herself without the help of the doctors or me. Um, she, we, I had been given an epidural, and shortly after the epidural, once all the doctors left, um, I lifted up the blankets in the hospital room, and there she was laying on my bed. <laughs> so um, she didn't need any oxygen. She came out breathing okay. She didn't really cry too much when she was born. Um, her eyes were wide open. She was very alert looking at everybody around the hospital room. Um, she was born weighing 4 pounds and 3 ounces, and she was 17 inches in length. Um, she stayed two days in the hospital on the main floor with me. Um, I had chosen not to do any genetic testing or not to have her go to the NICU. Um, you know, I just wanted her with me, and, you know, since we weren't able to, you know, know how well she was going to do, I just didn't want her first couple days of her life to be, you know, in the hospital, getting testing done, you know, having doctors do a bunch of stuff to her. So she stayed with me the whole time, and um, we did a lot of skin-to-skin -skin contact, and she did awesome. Um, we, when we had checked out of the hospital, we were told by um, the OB that if she was alive in six weeks to come in for a follow-up. And so we took her home, and she thrived at home very well. Okay. Some of the challenges and accomplishments that she has come across is um, when we had first brought her home from the hospital, she was only eating 10 milliliters every two hours, um, and she was eating orally. Um, she's now almost eight months old, and she eats four and a half ounces every three hours, and she also enjoys eating her baby cereal, squash, and carrots. Um, Evie Ann has also not been vaccinated, and that is due to her weight and my own personal choice. And thankfully, we have found a pediatrician in town that um, that works with with me and my decisions that I decide to make as far as vaccinations and stuff like that goes. Um, she hasn't. She didn't get sick until she went to the hospital for her first surgery, and she also hasn't had any seizures yet. Um, Evie Ann's kidneys have grown to be the appropriate size for her. Um, we did notice that there is a cyst on one kidney, so that is being monitored. Um, her heart also has an ASD, low lower valve functioning, and a dilated aorta. Um, recently, we had a liver ultrasound done, and it had shown several dark spots all over her liver. We did some blood work, and cancer was ruled out, but the findings on her liver are still unknown, and so an M MRI will be scheduled um, at a later date to find out exactly what's going on. Um, Evie Ann's right ear canal is also closed, and she can't hear out of it, but she can hear out of her left ear. Um, she also has glaucoma in both of her eyes, and she also has some digestive issues. Um, she has a cleft lip, or she had a cleft lip and palate repair surgery and an ear tube surgery in October of this year. Um, when she came out of recovery from that surgery, she did quit breathing four times, and they did need to do a PR on her while she was in the recovery room. Um, after that, she had been hospitalized for a week just to monitor things and see what may have caused her to quit breathing. Um, and while she was in the hospital, she had gotten her first cold. Um, two weeks after her surgery, the lip repair had come apart and the stitches didn't hold. And so we rescheduled another lip repair surgery in November. and. When we had gone in to get that lip repair done, um, the doctors had noticed that she had two very large top front teeth growing in. 
and so they had to extract those teeth and that was the cause of her lip repair coming apart the first surgery. Um, Evie Ann is now seven and a half months old. She weighs eight pounds and is 21 inches long. She can sit assisted, smile, laugh, and say words such as yeah, nah, -uh, why, hey, and hi. Um, things that we'd like you to know about her is um, even though she's an infant with wolf hirschhorn syndrome, she's very alert, determined, smart, feisty, and full of personality. She definitely knows when other people are talking about her, um, especially when we go to the doctor's office. She knows that the doctors are the ones in the green scrubs, and she gets very vocal when they come around. Um, she especially dislikes it when others talk about her syndrome and things that they think she won't be able to do. Um, she definitely knows what she likes and what she doesn't like, and she makes it well known. Um, you know, I also want to make sure that you know it's understood that a parent knows their child the best, and med medical professionals should acknowledge that and let the parent educate them on who their child is, rather than seeing a child as a diagnosis and assuming that they're like the medical textbooks um, that describe Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome. Um, I have definitely taken a different approach um, than some other parents that I know that have children with the syndrome. And, you know, I just go with what I believe is best for her. And I'm really thankful that I have met doctors that really do just follow my lead. Um, also, every child deserves a chance to try something on their own before assuming they can't do something and implementing medical intervention. And as far as that goes, you know, I mean, I'm a very vocal person, and I speak my mind, and, you know, I, I go with my gut instinct when it comes to my daughter. And if I had not been that way, I believe that Evie would have had to have stayed in the hospital for a while after she was born. Um, and I think that she would have came home with a feeding tube, which was highly recommended when we did leave the hospital. Um, and I'm glad that I worked with her on trying to get her to eat orally because now she really does enjoy eating and that's something that relaxes her and that she enjoys to do. And so um, I'm really glad that, you know, we didn't just immediately do all of the medical um, things that were suggested right away. Um, also, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that deletion sizes do not determine the severity of the syndrome. You know, EVM has a very, very large deletion size, and, you know, we were told that it was going to be, she's going to have a severe, she's going to be on the severe side of the uh, spectrum as far as wolf hirschhorn syndrome. Um, but, you know, she, yeah, each child is unique. They all have different deletion sizes, birth defects, and capabilities. And I think that she is doing amazing for you know her deletion size and just for her size overall. Um, also, when a child is diagnosed with Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome, I think it's very important to not only list the challenges that one may face, but equally as important to mention how well some individuals are doing. Um, I think that I would have been less frightened by her being prenatally diagnosed had the genetic counselors and doctors let me know that there were people who are living um, well and happy and that are adults, you know, and I think that I would have had more hope going into the delivery room knowing that. Um, so I think it's very important to, you know, give both spectrums, you know, when, when speaking to the parents, letting people know, okay, yes, this is what could happen, you know, and this is what may not happen. So um, that's EVM in a nutshell, and I'd like to thank you all for giving me the chance to share her story with you. Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Lortz, and my daughter, Lauren, is now nine years old, just turned nine yesterday. Lauren's story is a little different than most children with wolf hirschhorn but it's not that uncommon of those who have a microdeletion and weren't diagnosed in infancy. 
I had a pretty unremarkable pregnancy. I experienced a lot of morning sickness, and I also did not gain much weight. Due to Lauren's small size, my due date was pushed back multiple times. During my last trimester, they monitored her movement um, because she was not very active. Lauren was born on December 10, 2003. She weighed 6.2 pounds, which was much smaller than we anticipated due to me having gestational diabetes. After my birth, um, Lauren's OB noted that her umbilical cord was very short, kinked, and weird looking. He also noted that she had ear pits and mid-lined angel kisses. He explained to me that sometimes these two things can suggest problems, but he didn't necessarily think that would be the case with Lauren. And he went on and on about how beautiful her facial features were. I was able to keep Lauren in my patient room with me. Um, about 12 hours after her birth, I was alone with her in my room when she began to shake violently, turned blue, and began foaming at the mouth. I was a first-time mom, and my initial instinct was to grab the aspirator, and I just began sucking out the foam. At that time, I did not know that was a convulsion. The event only lasted a minute or two before she started to come out of it, and my husband and her nurse walked back into the room. I explained to the nurse what had just happened, and her comment to me was that newborns often forget to breathe and that the situation was never evaluated by the medical staff. I didn't know any better, and I believe what she told me. We stayed in the hospital for about two days, just the normal amount of um, time before being discharged. Um, and when she was discharged, we found out that she had already lost a pound. They did explain it was normal, um, but they didn't like the amount of weight that she had lost. We had a very good first pediatrician. Um, she followed Lauren's weight gain very closely. At um, about six months, she was admitted to the hospital because we suspected she was having seizures. During that day, our pediatrician learned she was moving away. And she explained to me she had a gut feeling that there was something going on with Lauren, but she just didn't know what it was. She ordered karyotype and also referred Lauren to be evaluated by early intervention due to her um, developmental delays. Her karyotype came back normal, and um, her EEG, MRI, and CT scan were normal as well. Her neurologist ended up diagnosing her with benign myclonus. She continued to have um, suspicious seizure activity, which was also witnessed by our early intervention team. She was developing her milestones, though they were very delayed and slow to develop. She had many upper respiratory infections and could only eat very small amounts of food at one time. Um, we did do a swallow study, and it showed that she did have silent aspiration. So we began seeing that there were all these little puzzle pieces coming together, but we still didn't have a clear picture of what was causing them. Um, our early intervention team was very instrumental in encouraging us to continue to voice our concerns with her doctor. By this time, we were on to our third pediatrician, who was referred to us as a special needs pediatrician. During one of our appointments with her, I was pushing for further testing and um, even asked to go back to see the neurologist. She made a comment to me that it was Munchausen syndrome. I had no idea what that meant, and I thought, yay, you know, we're, we're getting somewhere now. But during the appointment the following week, she ended up firing me from her practice for being 10 minutes late. This would have turned out to be the best thing that happened to us, though. Um, I ended up going to see another pediatrician that was referred to us. She was very receptive and actually was able to see the seizure activity we had been seeing. She then referred us to genetics for evaluation. At 21 months, FISH was used to diagnose 4P minus Wolf Hirschhorn, and her bone age was noted at 9 to 12 months. I received the diagnosis over the phone while I was at work. While I was so relieved to finally have a name for this and to be validated I wasn't crazy, I did a breaking down emotionally after the phone call and had to leave work early that day. The genetic counselor did not go into great details about the syndrome, but did arrange for my husband and I to go into the clinic for further discussion and also to have our DNA tested. The gloom and doom of the syndrome was never discussed, and we were cautioned not to read too much on the Internet since mostly the negatives are published. When her PT and I were searching the Internet several months prior to her diagnosis, we remembered that we had listed out her symptoms in the search tool and it indeed pulled up wolf hirschhorn syndrome. But both of us said, you know, that could not be what she had because she did not look like the pictures. Lauren experienced her first generalized um, convulsive status event at 23 months. 
the day after she had received a couple vaccinations. Lauren continued to have difficult to treat seizures. Atonic, absence, complex partial seizures are her typical types and they all tend to be atypical. By age four, she was having over 100 seizures a day and this was con confirmed through many EEGs. Lauren's seizures were difficult to control, so she was placed on the ketogenic diet for almost two years. The diet not only controlled 90% of her seizures, but she also began to make huge strides in her development. Lauren is very high functioning for a wolf Hirshhorn, however her health tends to be very unstable and she also has a very complex medical history. Throughout her life, GI issues have always been present. A feeding tube was placed at age four, primarily for hydration, and a Nissen was also done at the same time. In 2008, she had to be placed on TPN due to malnutrition after surgery to repair her hiatal hernia and her Nissen. She ended up remaining on TPN for almost two years. In 2010, she was diagnosed with pseudo-obstructions and intestinal dysmotility by Dr. Hayat Musa at Nationwide Children's Hospital. An ileostomy was placed shortly after, and that has greatly improved her quality of life. She will always have a chronic need for TPN and has needed her ostomy revised a couple of times already due to prolapse. Lauren is currently in the second grade. She's able to speak a little too much sing, walk, and run, which is more like a quick walk. Um, and even though Lauren is able to walk and run, she lacks the endurance needed to, um, to walk great distances and needs a wheelchair. Um, she has been evaluated and her psychologist um, assessed her for being developmentally around the age of a three to four year old. Um, she is tested to have mild to moderate deficits. At school, she's working on tracing numbers and letters, though this is a very difficult task for her. She is able to sight read mom, dad, the name of seven classmates, and can also pick out the name, pick out her name and a field of other names. She has ADHD and it um, greatly affects her ability to concentrate and retain information. She is integrated into a typical class, um, second grade classroom. However, this year she's having a very difficult time in that setting and we feel she's starting to know she's a little different than those kids and can't learn like they do. Um, Lauren started into puberty about a year ago, um, so we're about to go into our next stage of this journey. Um, and she is moody like any teenager you've ever met. Um, so I'd just like to leave you with a few points to remember. One, many parents comment to me um, that Lauren gives them such hope for their child, even if their child has a larger deletion. One of my very good 4P minus mom friends once said to me, it's a good thing God never asked me what kind of 4P minus child I would want. A higher functioning one who's very unstable with health and has lots of medical issues, or a lower functioning child who can't walk or talk, but is healthier than anyone I know. I don't know how I would have answered that because the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Two, um, because Lauren doesn't have the typical facial features for a person with a syndrome or um, condition with intellectual disability, often more expectation is put on her. We aren't sure yet how her brain atrophy will affect her as she ages. We do know that the ridges on her brain are beginning to smooth out, and this may cause problems in the future. Um, but we've agreed that we're no longer going to do any brain MRIs um, unless they're very necessary since this is, um, it's a condition we can't treat. Um, three, her doctors, my husband and I, decided a few years ago that we wanted to concern ourselves with her quality of life versus her quantity of life. Lauren loves to go to school and be in the community. Um, she just started cheerleading with Special Olympics. Um, but she can pick up every germ or illness that's going around our community. Um, but we want her to be able to experience life and be her own advocate. As you can kind of see in the picture here, um, Cami's Cause is our largest fundraiser in Indianapolis, which is not too far from us. And every year she likes to get on the stage and sing for the crowd. And um, that's her way right now of advocating. And four, um, in many ways, Lauren not being diagnosed in infancy was a huge blessing for us. Unlike many 4P minus parents, I had never um, experienced the constant fears that she was going to die as an infant, like stated in some literature. Um, that she was probably never going to walk or talk, and that she would be, quote, mentally retarded. 
And because of this, I think our hope was never taken away, and we were just always reaching to get her to her milestones. And then most importantly, um, when we saw Lauren's geneticist after her diagnosis, that's her genesis there in the picture, um, she told me that there would not be much information she could tell me about this because it was so rare. Um, but she did ask that I bring Lauren back to see her every year so she could see how Lauren grows and develops and also so she could learn more about 4P minus through my experiences and what I learned by attending our national conferences. Through the years, I've learned that the majority of parents who um, have a diagnosis delivered to them in a negative way, they tend to never go back to their geneticists or genetic counselors. So it's no wonder why many of you probably have never seen a 4P minus patient in your practice. Um, and more importantly, have never seen an older 4P minus patient. Um, I would encourage you to do as Lawrence Geneticist did and let your families know that you don't know, know much about this because um, we'll know if, you, if you're lying. It's pretty apparent um, when, when people say that they know about the condition and really don't. Um, and let them know you need them to teach you um, so you'll be able to treat future patients. I think so many of our families are very willing to open up and share what they know um, and allow you to be a part of their lives um, if you are receptive and have your arms open to learning from them. Um, so I want to sincerely thank you all for listening today um, and your time, and I will turn it over to Michelle. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I am Michelle Bartlett, and my son Jacob is 12 years old. He is diagnosed with Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome as well as cerebral palsy, and he also has PDD-NOS. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about his birth. Jacob, um, before I uh, had Jacob, I had miscarried twice, and I also had a grandmother with achondroplasia. Um, my sister and I have been doing genealogy research, and we're finding a lot of children born on that side of the family that don't survive. So I think this... Um, the translocation does come from me, and I think this is something that's probably been in our family for a very long time, but um, thanks to medical advances, now we know, and I, I don't think Jake would be here without everything that he's received so far. Um, if, so with this pregnancy, I had morning sickness every single day, um, and I also was diagnosed with IUGR at about 34 weeks. I had been placed on bed rest a few weeks before that, and um, Jake, the doctor, had done multiple phonograms and decided that Jake needed to be born at 35 weeks. And when he was born, he weighed 3 pounds, 13 ounces, and he was 18 inches long, so he looked like a planter's peanut, long and skinny. And uh, you can see from the pictures, he had bilateral club feet. Um, he also had hypospadia, and it, it, to us, he looked absolutely perfect, but he did have a couple of birth issues. Um, he spent two weeks in the hospital, and we had a hard time getting him to eat, and that's why we were in there for so long. Um, he had some facial differences that we noticed, but to us, you know, he's a newborn baby, and he's beautiful. He, we, he did gain weight slowly but surely, so we were able to take him home. And when he went home, he weighed four pounds, five ounces. And we were very nervous parents, but we went through it, and it was wonderful taking him home. Uh, about Jacob, some of the information on the next slide is... Um, he wasn't diagnosed from birth. It wasn't until he was about seven months of age I went in for a well-child appointment and a different pediatrician had came in and he looked at Jake and he said, you know, he's got a couple birth defects, the hypospadia and the club feet, and he has some facial features, some low-set ears that lead me to believe he might have a syndrome. And Jake was also having a hard time gaining weight. So at that point, um, he put in a referral for geneticists. We went out and I, you know, I took Jake out to the car and called my husband and cried for a few minutes. Um, I work, I, I am a social worker and I've worked in sheltered workshops. So I've been around lots of people with syndromes. It just, it was one of those things I wasn't prepared for that day. Um, it, after a few weeks, we did get in to see the geneticist. And within two weeks, they had all the testing complete. And they called us on the telephone since we lived up in Wichita Falls, Texas. And the geneticist was in Dallas-Fort Worth. And they said, Jacob has... Uh, Pitt Rogers Dank syndrome. He won't live past age two. He won't talk, walk. He's not going to function very well. And um, we were, I'd say we were probably devastated for just a few minutes. But since Jake was already seven months of age, we 
have already been treating them like any other kid. So my husband and I just pretty much decided we were going to keep doing what we were doing and push forward. Um, they did tell us to stay away from any .com websites, but I did look up all the information on .org, .edu sites, and I just kind of kept it in the back of my brain and didn't get too overwhelmed with all of it. Um, our first pediatrician that we had fired, we lived in uh, North Texas, and Jacob kept getting respiratory infections. And one of the things that was on the market was syndesis, and we were in and out of the hospital constantly. And I had asked the doctor when Jacob was uh, over two years of age, could we do synergist injection again? And he said, no, according to the Academy of Pediatrics, we can't do that. And I said, yeah, but he, you know, he has this rare syndrome, and I'd, I'd like to try it. And he still said no. So I called the manufacturer for the um, medication synergist, and they had a special needs study for children like Jake. And he received that injection until he was probably about six years of age. And it helped tremendously because we didn't have as many respiratory infections after that. One of the things that was very hard for us was the my husband's military. So we lived in North Texas. And most of the specialists for Jacob were in Dallas, Fort Worth, or Oklahoma City. So our family, we were constantly traveling. Um, it just it was nonstop. And we it was very hard for us. Um, the, our, we finally decided at one point that I needed to be at home to manage his care, and I quit work. We sold everything and downsized, and it's probably the best thing we ever did. Um, we did finally get a chance to move to Omaha, Nebraska with the military, and we got uh, closer to great medical care. Uh, we were on base with the pediatrics there for a while, but because of the lack of continuity of care, they signed off on us to see an off-base pediatrician. We had a great pediatrician off base, but um, she had made one of the things with kids with 4P minus syndrome is uh, doctors can have a tendency to not take into account all the different, the medical complexity of the child. And she actually had made a very bad mistake that left him in the NICU from a simple viral infection that turned quite ugly, and um, he crashed really bad. And she apologized to us, and she stayed our doctor for about five years after that. Um, another pivotal physician we met in Nebraska was Dr. G. Bradley Schaefer, who wrote the first handbook for families. And he's a geneticist and endocrinologist. Um, he wasn't happy at first when he met us because we had started Jacob on genotropin, which is a growth hormone, when he was two and a half years of age. They had constantly talked about a G-tube for Jacob um, because of his lack of weight gain. And my husband and I kept fighting it and um, trying different things. And then I had read somewhere about a random medical journal about a child that did the genotropin, and it helped tremendously. Um, it doesn't help like his mental development, but it did help his physical growth. He um, he seemed to you can see from the beginning when he was at three years of age, he was very thin and small, and he had a hard time getting around. At four, that was about a year or two, year and a half in with the growth hormone, and he was developing more strength and getting stronger. So it helped him quite a bit, but when he was about six years of age, he started growing too much, so we had to remove him off the growth hormone. And one of the things I loved about Dr. Schaefer was he was very open, honest, and very truthful with us when he told us he was growing too quick. And then Jake's later on, a few years later, his growth slowed down. He asked us, do you want to put him back on the growth hormone? He wasn't fond of it, but he understood it did help Jacob. And Jacob's not growth hormone deficient at all. Um, but he said if we wanted to try it again, he would be happy to do that. And he said, but, you know, as he gets bigger, it's going to be harder to care for him because Jacob isn't an independent walker and still needs help with diapering. And um, we decided not to go back on the growth hormone and just keep moving forward. Um, Jake was in school for about four years, and then we finally decided to homeschool due to immune system issues because he was constantly sick. Um, the school also I had a hard time trying to get them to see past the diagnosis. And they had even lost him at one point, which is very hard to hear. And that's just because Jake's very bright, and he was in his walker, and he knows how to use handicap buttons, and he let himself out of the building. So he's very smart. He was diagnosed with PDD-NOS in school, which helped quite a bit because we started doing ABA uh, therapy with him. And that has helped us teach him many things. He knows his colors. He knows letters and numbers. And you can show him pictures, and he can identify things. So he's, he's very bright. He functions at probably about 
anywhere between a three and five year old depending on the skill. He does have major seizure disorder and he has all types of seizures. Uh, the biggest time when he has seizures is from illness, surgeries, growth spurts, that kind of stuff. Um, he did have a major seizure that lasted two hours long and left him in the PICU. And it was from a complication from the flu where he ended up with a bacterial infection in this uh, lymph node of his stomach. And we had a very hard time dealing with the attendant, attending physician because they wouldn't listen to us. And Jake is nonverbal, and I kept trying to tell him something was wrong. Uh, but he did cease for two hours. Um, and we now have a seizures controlled with Depakote and Keppra. Um, every time we moved with the military, we'd have to start over, which was really tough because I, you have to find all the new physicians. Usually I ask for referrals, like from the geneticist's office. I'll ask for a referral to geneticists wherever we're moving to kind of get everything lined up. Um, one of the great things about Jacob is he just he teaches me so much about myself, and I get an opportunity to meet lots of other families. And uh, one of the things we did was we started military support groups at the bases, and it was for children with all different types of disabilities and disorders, and we became a really strong group that supported one another. Um, it also led me later to write Caregiver's Ladder to help with families um, deal with whether it be a uh, mental health type diagnosis or a developmental or even a rare syndrome. Um, it, they all come together and support one another. And then I also participate in Project DOC and a medical education program training residents. It's very important for me that doctors really take a step back and really listen to families that have kids with rare disorders. Um, I, as far as our marriage goes with my husband, there is quite a stress. <laughs> but we do tend to help one another out a lot and we kind of complement each other, which is nice. Um, we decide on medical stuff together. We sit down and make a decision. I usually do the research and give the information to him and we decide. My husband's having a lot of anxiety right now due to all the seizures from when Jake was younger, so he's trying to process through that. When Jake gets sick, it causes him a lot of anxiety. Um, the outside world is we. everybody's so very kind. I mean, Jake does look different. He has a little bit of different facial differences. Um, but, you know, he has an iPad attached to his wheelchair and everybody is absolutely in awe of that and he can communicate and they find it really cool that he can communicate. We do have our occasional gawker, but once they get a chance and I talk to, to them a little bit about Jake, they open up very well. Um, some of the things that I want you to know about uh, families when you're dealing with them is a child with a disability can and will have rare issues with medications, illnesses, surgeries. If you're not aware and understanding how, how, how complicated our kids are neurologically, physically, and mentally, and so on, you'll make a huge mistake. And we've had, we personally have had these mistakes made, and it's very important for, um, for people to slow down, when doctors to slow down and take their time. A nonverbal child is also very hard to treat, so listen to the parents and take your time when talking to a family to really kind of discover what's going on with the child. Please respect the parents' right to do what they feel is best for their child. Um, just because you recommend something doesn't mean a parent will necessarily follow through with it. Or just because you write a prescription doesn't mean that they will use it or that an insurance company will cover it. Um, be very open and honest with us, but don't take away our hope. Um, let families know that there are children, the kids with wolf horn, there's a very wide perspective out there. And um, you, they are living well past two years of age, and Jacob functions very well but don't take family's hope away. They need that. And that the last thing is our kids are more than a diagnosis. The diagnosis doesn't define them. Jake is Jake. He just has Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome, but it doesn't define who he is. It's just a part of who he is. And that is it. And I appreciate your time, and thank you for listening about Jake. He's an awesome kid. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica, Amanda, and Michelle. It was, it was really great to hear your stories. And thank you also to the audience. I know we're over time now, um, and, and quite a few of you have stayed on to, to finish. Um, I want to remind you guys that there is a question feature, so you're able to send in questions if you have one for any of the panelists. Um, and, and while we're giving you a minute to send in questions, I just also want to take a minute to acknowledge everyone who's on this slide for, for their support and, and hard work that went into making this webinar a success. I think everyone deserves a medal. And I'd like to point out here that this young lady is 27, and she goes to Zumba every single day. And this young man is 20. He recently graduated high school and is uh, very much enjoying his job at, at ShopCo. Um, and as Amanda mentioned, 
there is an annual music festival fundraiser and celebration near Indianapolis. It's called Cami's Cause. And it is uh, held to honor and remember those individuals with 4P minus. Um, specifically, there is a butterfly release ceremony in which a butterfly is let go for each member of the group who has passed away. And it is truly one of the most powerful ceremonies I've, I've ever attended, uh, attended. And I hope that uh, some of you may get a chance to go someday. So with that, I'll turn it over to the PEDS SIG co-chairs to ask some questions. Hi, everyone. We're still um, open to taking any questions. I guess one question that um, we wanted to start with was, um, for each of the parents, can you tell us what your child's greatest accomplishment has been or what you feel like your child's greatest accomplishment has been? Um, this is Amanda. Um, I think that's really hard as a parent to pick one thing. Um, just surviving, and in a nutshell, is um, pretty significant for our population. Um, I think for Lauren, though, you know, since she is high functioning, um, I think her becoming her own advocate at this point um, is pretty amazing. Um, watching her try to participate in the Special Olympics, trying to learn how to read and write. Um, they're very hard things for her to do, but she's attempting them. Um, so just her, her overall um, determination and will um, just, you know, makes all of those things possible. So. Michelle or Veronica? Oh. <laughs> Veronica, you want to go? Yeah, I'm sure. Um, I'd have to agree with um, Amanda, you know, surviving has been one of the greatest accomplishments I believe Evie has made, um, along with eating. Um, being able to eat on her own orally has been a huge accomplishment, and that's something that we have worked very hard on, um, and it's been a team effort. but. Um, you know, she does really well at eating, so I, I'd have to say that that's her largest accomplishment, especially, you know, since she has the cleft palate and lip. Um, eating has been a little bit more of a challenge for her than it would be for other children that don't have the cleft lip and palate. For, I, I have to agree, it's surviving, I think, is the biggest. Um, but, you know, as far as Jacob goes, some of the stuff that he does, showing people his his awesome skills. Um, people tend to get so focused on the, the, the syndrome that they don't see past what he can do. Um, so I think the, you know, the school losing him is an excellent example. He was in a walker. He doesn't walk by himself, but he knows how to hit handicap buttons and let himself out of the building. And he wanted to go home that day, so that's what he did. Um, we have him on a gluten-free diet now, and I can ask him to hand me something, and he'll hand it to me, and. Um, he just he keeps learning and keeps progressing, so that's just absolutely incredible. Thank you, everyone. Um, another question we had was, um, when is a 4P deletion considered Wolf-Horsham syndrome? Is it based on the critical region, or is it based on the phenotype? Um, if someone could comment on that. Hi, this is Dr. Calhoun. Um, I would say that it's not based on the critical region because we have patients who don't have critical region deletions who do clearly have the, um, the phenotype. So it's a combination of um, the clinical phenotype, although if you don't have a deletion somewhere in 4P, you can't have Wolf-Hirschhorn. But we do definitely base it more on the phenotype than the exact location of the deletion. Thank you. Um, we also were wondering about whether or not um, for counselors who are using some of the classic pictures for um, teaching or showing parents that these pictures are so much more are much more wonderful, and so we're wondering if the parents would allow us to use some of these pictures when talking to other families. I think that's for Amanda. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and, and you know, if you go to the 4P minus support group on our main web um, homepage. 
there's a couple of videos on our website. <clears throat> One is um, a video, basically an infomercial about our, our um, support group. And Nick was on that the next slide. He's given the peace sign. Um, <clears throat> there's actually an interview with <clears throat> Nick. Sorry. <clears throat> there's an interview with Nick. So Nick actually talks, um, and I think that's a good resource to send your parents to see. Um, as well as um, their parents. So it would be Nick's parents and then um, two sets of other parents. Um, we have a slideshow of our most recent conference that Rena, Megan, and Mallory went to. Um, and then there's a pretty long slideshow, but it, we have about 130 um, kids featured in that video. And there's a little caption that basically, you know, a lot of them say, you know, doctor told me I wouldn't live past two. Um, you know, look at me proving them wrong. So there's a lot of those um, throughout that slideshow, and most all of the pictures in that slideshow are color. And I think color means a lot. Um, when you see it black and white, to me, that's kind of a death thing. So to see pictures in color, um, and to see that vibrance in life makes a difference. So, Amanda? Yes. Would it be correct to say that um, Jeanette Kelser should be, feel free to use the website yes. for counseling? Mm -hmm. My understanding is that the parents have expressed permission that anything that's on the website. Yep. And I can be contacted through the website as well. We have brochures, um, and we have an online um, community for parents um, where they can get access uh, to some of the research that's not available on public. We have a 4P minus family guidebook. Um, it was written in the 90s. It's kind of out to date, but the basic information is still solid. Um, we're working to update that, um, as well as our newsletters, you know, up-to-date information on national gatherings. So um, I, would, I would always recommend to point them to the, the support group. Um, and then from that, we, we, you know, can connect them to families close to them. I have a lot of counselors that will email and, and let me know that they have a patient, um, but their parents are fluent in Spanish and not English. I get that often. We do have some, just one resource um, translated into Spanish. Um, that might be the most helpful thing right now that we can provide them. Um, but, you know, the Internet, you can translate pretty easily now, and you can translate emails. So I think that parent-to-parent -parent correspondence is crucial with our syndrome. Thank you. Um, another question, what is the best way to go about testing parents um, after a diagnosis of wolf horsham is made? Is it karyotype fish or array? Uh, this is uh, Dr. Sarah South. Um, most parents are going to, um, well, let me back up and say I would not do a microarray in the parents. If the parent has a genomic alteration that is predisposing to um, the 4P deletion in their gametes or in their, their offspring, then they are probably a balanced version of that rearrangement. And genomic microarray does not detect balanced alterations. It just detects whether or not there's too little or too much DNA. But it does not determine where that DNA is located. So the concern in a parent is, is 4P in the correct location in their genome? If it's in the right location, then it's unlikely that there will be a deletion of it in the subsequent offspring, their children. So the best way is to do a technology that can tell you, is 4P in the correct place? So if you know which piece of 4P is missing, then you can use a technology to make sure that it is in the correct location. And I would recommend as a single technology fish. So you first determine this, the deletion by microarray would be my preference. And then use fish to make sure that 4P is in the correct location in both parents. That would be the um, probably most comprehensive way. Now, a number of parents have had chromosome studies. Um, and on a case-by-case -case basis, those could be reviewed to make sure that they would be sufficient. Usually if the child is identified by chromosomes, then chromosomes could be sufficient in the parents. But I would take those on a case-by-case -case basis just based upon the variability of the genetic alterations. 
Great, thank you. Amanda, I have a question for you about uh, Lauren's pediatrician and the one, the third one, I think you said that accused you of Munchausen. I was wondering if you ever went back to that pediatrician and educated them about what actually was wrong with Lauren and, you know, what her deletion was and educated him about that she actually had a real syndrome and you weren't doing anything to her to cause that and how that went if you did do that. You know, I couldn't do it in face. Um, there were too many emotions there. Um, I probably would have gotten in trouble. Um, but what I, I sent a fax um, because actually just weeks prior to that when she, um, we had found out that she had silent aspiration, um, I was asked to contact her to see if we should stick in Lauren's formula or use cereal, like use a thickening agent or cereal because cereal would give her more calories and, and um, the OT wasn't sure which would be best for her. So I had asked her about that, and she said um, neither. She wasn't aspirating. Um, and, and so once I got the diagnosis of 4P minus and did read that many babies pass away before the age of two, I'm, you know, thinking to myself with the upper respiratory infections, it's a good thing she didn't kill Lauren and that I didn't listen to her counsel, and I went ahead and thickened that formula. So um, I just had to send a fact. And I and I just had to send her the gene review that was available at the time, and I just put, you know, this is what she was officially diagnosed with. We're fortunate for her that it wasn't that she's a best case scenario, um, and that she's still alive. So, I think when you deal with doctors that don't quite get it, a lot of emotions start to come about. So sometimes just removing yourself is the best option, and just not going back to that practice if, if you get negativity. I, I should have left a long time ago, you know, in retrospect. Yeah, it sounds like you did a good job with that. <laughs> I think that's all the questions we have right now. Um, so I want to thank all of our speakers so much. This is a really excellent presentation. Um, if anyone who's on the call does have questions after the fact for them, we're happy to, to take them and distribute. So you can um, email Carolyn and I or the prenatal SIG chairs. I'm sure they'd be happy to distribute. Um, to everyone and, and thank you all so much. And this will be posted on the PED SIG and pre um, and the prenatal SIG websites for people to view after the fact and then if you have co coworkers or colleagues or other friends that want to view this presentation they will be able to do so at another time. So thank you to everyone. And uh, this is Rena. Just one final comment. I wanted to let the viewers know that we are going to be sending out a survey um, to get some feedback and also to give you the opportunity um, to let us know if you'd like to be involved with an upcoming 4P meeting in your local area. So look out for that uh, survey link. Hey, one, one last thing, because um, I know many of you might be going to the American College of Medical Genetics Conference in 2013. Um, we will be there. Rena and I will be there. We um, are going to have a booth for um, the support group and 4P- and Wolf Hirshhorn. So if you um, are attending, please stop by and say hello and um, we can meet you personally. Answer any questions you have. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a Thanks. good day.